Hello and welcome to another episode of the Autoblog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. Joining me today in studio is Associate Editor Joel Stocksdale. How you doing, man? Good, doing good. Doing good. And uh, Road Test Editor Reese Counts. What's going on? How's it going? Going well. I We got to mention a couple things here. One, we're in a conference room that's about 110 degrees. Summer is finally here in Michigan, uh, but we're in the hottest room in the middle of the office. It is what it is. Uh, life is great. We've got some awesome cars we, we're going to talk about. So, hey, we can't complain too much, but, you know, it's pretty warm in here. So, we've been driving some hot metal, uh, the Dodge Charger Scat Pack, uh, BMW M5, and the Lexus LC500. Those are all in our fleet right now. I am psyched just like even talking about them. Uh, we've driven them. We're going to basically break them down. Then some news, uh, lots of news going on, uh, kind of rapid fire segment. Talk about the GMC Jimmy, maybe coming back. Ford Puma, Ford Bronco using the Ranger in line four, reportedly. Uh, rumors more about the Land Rover Defender. Will that live up to expectations? And the Gladiator, uh, that's the Jeep pickup truck, is going for a ton of money. We're going to talk about that. Lastly, we will spend your money and it will be, uh, we're going to spend some green for a green car. So let's jump right in. Uh, this is a car I just got out of this morning. I had a blast in this thing. This is the Dodge Charger RT Scat Pack with the Dynamics package. I don't really know what that is, but I did two burnouts like before I had gotten a mile from the office. One was somewhat intentional. One was totally accidental. I literally pulled out of our office here onto Woodward, hit the gas, kind of like let out a breath. You know, it is the end of a work day. You're relaxing, hit the gas, accelerate, go home. Most cars, it's fine. You just hit, you know, 45 miles an hour or so with these. Charger lets out this, like, growl. There's a ton of bass. Back end starts to fishtail. It's like, all right, yeah. I, I Of course I knew I'm driving the big naturally aspirated V8, but um, it's awesome. It's on really. Uh, in a week that I've driven the M5 with the competition pack and the Kia Stinger, which is another pretty awesome V8 uh, sports sedan, I think the Dodge Charger might be the most fun, full stop. So, kind of a hot take, but hey. So I actually spun the tires coming out of the office when I took it to lunch yesterday. So you are not alone on that. Yeah, I tripped the tires a couple times by accident. There's uh, just kind of like... But then it stops being an accident, right? You're just like, yeah, let's light them up. Tip, in, <laughs> tip into the throttle is a little sensitive, but I got used to it after a few miles. But um, yeah, you are not alone. Uh, but the car itself is awesome. And this thing, I, I love the way this one's specced. I mean, it's um, got performance options, but it's got cloth interior. There's no moonroof. I mean, it's uh, I mean, it's pretty like bare bones as far as like a Charger performance car goes. But yeah, this thing's good. It mm. looks good. It sounds good. Um, these things are all over Detroit, and they've been around for a few years now, and I still dig the way this thing looks. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about this in the er office earlier. FCA paint colors are the best, uh, whether it's like the actual color or the name. I think this one is uh, what F8 green. Um, one of the more boring names, but it's a really good color. <laughs> yeah, this might be my favorite color. Um, I think we saw it on the sh show floor either last fall in LA or in Detroit, I think for the first time. At least I saw it. I think there was a tra uh, Challenger with like a matte black hood and this, it looked rad. And like coming into the office uh, on Monday and seeing this, it was pretty exciting. I mean, with the 20 inch uh, tires, they're black forged wheels. Um, yeah, the green is almost like, I would compare it to almost like a military green, yeah. forest green. But with lots of metallic. Yeah. It's, it's almost, a, it's almost, almost got a little bit of like candy look to it. It's got a lot of depth to it. That's really nice. I think the charger to your point, Reese, is really aging well. I mean. They're, they've been like, I would say probably three or four generations since they bought it back, brought it back, uh, you know, geez, what, 14 years ago now. But um, really, there have only been like two main generations. And this current one, I mean, it's, you know, it's curvaceous, but it's still got that charger feel. Headlights look good up front, regardless of the spec. Um, you know, that long hood. I will say this, the interior is pretty Spartan in there. It's you know, as a charger owner, I'll fully cop to that. I don't drive it very much at all as I think of it. Uh, so I'm sort of like their base here, but, um, 
I mean, the interior of the 19 is not that much better than the interior of the 06, which I got way before I, you know, even got into this kind of field. So it's, yeah, I think, I don't know. I would say they have, they need to upgrade the interior. I think it also is very trim specific. You know, you could get a charger that has pretty, you know, fairly nice interior, but some of the plastics, some of the materials do feel a little cheap. That being said, for $46,000, for uh, just a wampin V8 muscle car, I almost don't care. It's fine. And I think one of the things that really surprises me is that it actually handles pretty decently, especially for something that's so huge and, I mean, is built on a platform that dates back to 2005 when they first came out, and even further back considering that it originally had some Mercedes stuff under, <laughs> under the chassis. But, like, it doesn't roll much. It turns in pretty eagerly. I mean, it's got... A, it's nose heavy, but like, it's really manageable. You can actually really hustle this thing into corners. So in a week where I've basically said I like this, or at least had more fun driving this than an M5 and a Kia Stinger, my other sort of takeaway from this charger is I think the 392 is the best um, charger challenger like performance engine. I think give me this engine over the Demon or the Hellcat all day. Naturally aspirated, the way it sounds is awesome i mean it's got this like raw rumble there's a bass when you kind of like really tip into the throttle uh i mean i don't know maybe you guys disagree with me you want a demon or something but this to me is the motor this is it i would like a bass hellcat like um i like the I don't know. That supercharger wine and the Hellcat is something that's, like that's it's, what I was gonna it's say. It's really like, intoxicating to dip into that thing. Because I do love this engine, but you're absolutely right. Because like, yeah. when we had the, the Hellcat red eye, I was like, oh my gosh, I love hearing that shriek every time I go up on ramps. So that's a shriek too. That it really is, does. It is. It's wonderful. <laughs> I saw somebody posted on Twitter the other day. Do you guys know what used Hellcats are going for? No, I haven't looked at them. Around, it's a really good question. Around 40,000. Interesting. <laughs> you can get a like, pretty clean like charger or challenger hellcat for around forty thousand. um and you know the new versus used arguments net like it's an apples and oranges thing but uh you know like really any version of this car i had a rental spec uh like v6 like white on black cloth like charger a few years back when my gti was in the shop and that was awesome i mean every iteration of this car is really really good and it like I don't know. I it's it's ancient and you can like rag on it for having like Mercedes parts that probably you could find under the hood and uh under the platform of my Mercedes, but uh they've done a really decent job of like keeping it uh modern and feeling pretty modern uh, at least as far as the way it drives. Um yeah, I dig this thing a lot. Charger, good time. Yeah, very good time. <laughs> Cool. So let's move along to the uh, BMW M5. Uh, this one cost uh, $129,000, almost one hundred and thirty. So this was not cheap. Um, I think in some ways, the reason I like the Charger so much is I drove the M5 the night before, got stuck in traffic. So full disclosure, I'm not saying metrically or like serious auto blog review, the Charger is better than the M5. Come on. I know. But I had more fun on Tuesday night in the Charger than I did on Monday night in the M5. And, I mean, I don't know, for 130 this car, I wouldn't say it's not worth it, but, I mean, you slap an M5 badge on a car, you got a lot to live up to. Uh, this is a brilliant machine, certainly. Love to get out on a track. Definitely on an open expressway. Um, yeah. So, so, I'm glad that you said something about that, because... About a year, like several months ago, maybe a year ago, when we had an M5 in, uh, had a friend up with me and I had it signed out for the weekend. And we, this was also when we still had our long term Mustangs. And actually, nobody had signed out the Mustangs. So I actually came back and dropped off the M5 and took the Mustang out because I was having more fun with the Mustang. It made better noises and felt more usable around town. So in the right mode, in like on the right road, the M5 is really good. But like, so you you fire up the charger and it's just like ready to go. Like with the M5, you have to turn it in Sport Plus. You have to like open up the exhaust. Like the you have to fiddle with the settings. And I get that this is like supposed to be like an all around performance car. 
That's what's been so appealing about the M5 for years, but I don't know. Like it's the fact that you have to fiddle with a few settings and it's not just like turn it on and go like the charger is a little disappointing. I mean, it's really, really, really fast, really fast. Um, and it, it's got a nice interior. It's quiet. It's comfortable. Um, but yeah, there's something just like missing about it. Like compared to the AMG Mercedes, which are always kind of hairy and like, um, a little like burly and like you, same thing about the charger. It's just always kind of ready to go. And the M5 is a little sedate and it's fun some of the time, but it's not fun all the time. 617 horsepower from a 4.4 liter twin turbo V8. Uh, I like the motor. Uh, like I said, I have much room to roam with this thing. Uh, Reese, you mentioned this is great on the right roads. I think that road might be like, you know, Monticello raceway or something. I mean, I don't know. This just, to me, this is not a daily driver. I think you want to spend your money and load up, uh, you know, maybe a five series. It don't go with the M5. I realize an M5 buyer is a very, it's a niche market. It's, um, you know, definitely for the, the, the well healed enthusiast, but you could get a lot of car, you know, for like a much lower spec five series and still have, I think a good amount of fun with it. So I'm on BMW's website right now. A base five series starts at around fifty five thousand, uh, and you can get a let's see, you can get an M two for sixty thousand. So you could buy both of these cars, and I think that would probably be better than just driving the M two. That's a really smart move. Yeah. I like that play. And you can get a manual in the M two, and it's mm -hmm. just a little more fun all the time. I mean, the M two is really really good. It's not like BMW's. And it's not like the M5 is bad. I mean, it's really, really fast, but it's, yeah, I kind of agree with you. It's, I don't know. It would not be my choice at that price point, especially at this price point, even with the competition package. Like back when I drove it, I, I'm sure I would have had a lot more fun if I had like an open racetrack where I could really take advantage of all the power and all the traction. But around town, I was just a little bit bored almost. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a lot of car for the street. Um, and I mean, that's the case with like all of these cars at this point. Um, but I don't know. I, I, I like a car that's just fun all the time and like older M fives used to be like that. Um, and I, I, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the all wheel drive system. I don't know if it's the steering. It's, it's just, it doesn't feel exciting all the time. And I'm, I'm becoming more like interested in cars that are just like ready to go from the box and not having to fiddle with a bunch of drive modes. There's six different settings for the transmission in this thing. Six. Um, that's, and, I think that's overkill. Like, and that's fine, I guess, but, and there, the M1 and the M2 buttons on the steering wheel are cool and you could like preset it and just kind of double tap or single tap, um, depending on which one you want to do. So it's relatively easy once you dial it in, but I don't know. I suppose that's the other argument that like, if you own the car, you'll figure out what settings you like. You'll yeah. preset them to the M buttons and then you'll never have to worry about it again. I, I, so I do like the customization. That's one thing that I actually think is a strength of the M5 and some of the M cars. Uh, I like being able to say, I want to put this thing in like comfort on the chassis and then sport for the steering. I mean, I'm weird like that, but I think that's kind of cool. Um, this thing looks pretty good too. I was definitely staring at it in my driveway. It's, it looks like an M5. I think they've gotten a little busier with their design. It's a little fiercer, a little sharper than, you know, BMWs in general used to be. Um, but I'm reading, looking at this comparison, what of our competitors did, uh, uh, it's car and driver and they had CTS five, excuse me, CTS V Mercedes AMG E63 S Porsche Panamera turbo. And of course the M5. Yeah, I mean, of those, I think I'd take most of those other cars, except for probably the Porsche, just because I'm not a big Panamera guy, ahead of the M5. Maybe the Cadillac, not so much. I'd probably actually take the M5 over the Cadillac. But that's, that's pretty tight, too. I mean, I like I think, the Cadillac I think I'd take a the Cadillac lot. Yeah. Over the BMW. <laughs> it just, yeah, I mean, the last time we had a uh, CTS V in the fleet, I was psyched to drive it. It was awesome. If you guys might remember that, I think it was last fall. It was like, matte black gray wheels or something 
that car was sweet. That had like a real presence to it. I mean, I don't think we need to re-legislate that Cadillac is really killing it in a lot of different ways. But um, yeah, I don't know. M5, awesome car, but didn't really, you know, I didn't fall for it this week. Let's put it that way. And it sounds like you guys are on that same plane. One thing I do want to note, um, I was talking to some friends. You mentioned Car and Driver. They put uh, an M5 competition on the dyno a few weeks back, and it turns out to be this very same car we've got. Oh, nice. Uh, this car is rated by BMW at seven, 617 horsepower at the crank. They dynoed it and got 617 at the wheels. Well, that's So this thing's probably putting close to 700 horsepower on the ground. That's insane. Um, so close to... Yeah. A Hellcat, yeah, which you can a, have for use. Literally half. A lot. Well, you can get a new one for <laughs> literally half the cost. Um, I almost would argue, first of all, that's awesome. Yeah. But it's also, think about it though. Like if your car is 700 horsepower and you're not telling people that. I think this is just a BMW thing. I mean. I don't know. I mean, that may be a little dangerous. I, I don't suppose know. there's always the possibility that it's a ringer. <laughs> yeah. I that mean, could, well, that could be. That yeah. wouldn't be the first time that's ever happened in a press fleet. No kidding. Um, all right, so let's move along here to the Lexus LC500 Coupe. This car is drop-dead gorgeous. It's red. It's got the Wampin V8. It's a great week for naturally aspirated V8s in the Autoblog fleet. It's like the summer is here officially as of last week. Um, it's the weather's warm, and we're getting just some awesome sports cars. And this one is a lot of fun. I know you guys had some time in it earlier this week. I'm psyched. It is 3.56 on Wednesday afternoon, if you're ever curious when we're recording this. Uh, in an hour and four minutes, I plan to be driving this car. But uh, what did you guys think? This is probably the one or two or three bit, uh, prettiest cars on the road right now. I mean, this thing is a stunner, um, which is, I was always, I was blown away when they revealed it a few years back because it doesn't look that much different than some of the other Lexuses, um, especially the RC. It's got basically the same, like, uh, uh, design treatment like up front and from the profile, but whatever Lexus has done to it, smoothed it out, like stretched the proportions to this. I mean, it's got a really long hood and really short deck. Um, looks awesome. I mean, it looks really, really good. Um, the inside too, uh, it's very Japanese while still being like functional. Like, uh, I like some of the interiors on some of the other cars, but like they're very German, very clean and, I don't know. There's some like weird organic flair to the LC that I just love. Um, yeah, and the engine. The five liter is amazing. It's got less power than some of the competition, but I really don't care. Um, 471 horsepower is a lot in this thing. It's one of the few naturally aspirated V8s like, still around. Everybody's going to small displacement turbos, uh, except for like GM and FCA, who are still running uh, naturally aspirated V8s. And but, Lexus, too, at points, too. Yeah, and it's... I don't know. This thing is this thing is killer. I love a good GT, and this is just like a really, really comfortable, fast, quiet car. I'd love to put like a thousand miles on this. Um, I I had it all weekend. I drove it a ton. Um, I, every time I get behind the wheel of these things, I I walk away impressed. Yeah, the, I totally agree. This is easily one of my favorite cars on sale today. Definitely in my top ten. Might even be in my top five. And like we said, the design is amazing. I think part of it is that it's so taut. Everything feels, every, if everything looks, I mean, kind of shrink wrapped around like the chassis, kind of like, uh, well, some, in some ways it kind of reminds me of the third generation RX-7, just this very like tight, smooth, clean shape, um, but a little bit more geometric, a little bit more wedgy. Um, it's got great design details. The taillights, I love them so much because it's got this sort of like infinity sort of look to it where like when it turns on, it's got reflective surfaces inside and out. So it just looks like the taillights, like if you look down the middle, it looks like it goes on forever, like into the distance. It's really neat. Um, the interior is fantastic. I, there, everything is nice materials. It's leather, it's suede, it's metal. It, it's so nice. It's got all these cool swoops and lines and it feels really special. I was really disappointed that they sent us one with a black interior though. Cause that, that shows it off the least impressively. It looks better in like tan or my favorite, this like indigo and white and tan like interior. Yeah. Um, there's, 
there's some really good colors. I mean, I, I, I like the black, but I, I probably, if this was my car, I'd probably go like dark blue over tan. Uh, we had this, mm -hmm. I think the first one I drove was that color combination. I just fell in love with it immediately. Um, but the big spindle grill that everybody ragged on for years looks perfect on this thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like new ground for Lexus. It just like is the culmination of like everything they've been like building for the past few years. I mean, it, it looks perfect. Um, I'm, they showed off the convertible concept last fall. I am stoked for that because I think this thing would be like really good top down car. Um, I, feel, I feel so conflicted about the convertible because on the one hand, I mean, I like convertibles in general and it would be all the better for hearing that fantastic V8. But on the flip side, I also hate seeing any part of that design cut off because I like the shape of it so much. <laughs> yeah, I just, I agree. I, I like the coupe lines, but I don't know, especially this week. Now it's finally getting warm here in Michigan. Like rolling around with the top down would have been very lovely. Mm -hmm. Side note, was Lexus maybe like ahead of its time here with these big crazy grills? Like we kind of all made fun of the spindle grill. And I mean, on certain versions of its cars, it does look like a cartoon. But then look at how big the grills are in BMWs now and Mercedes yeah. and almost everybody that Maserati we had it here looked like the like front end of a dreadnought. And it's like, Hey, maybe they knew something. It's their identity. And you know, on many of their cars, they look pretty good. Yeah. I, I, I think it's taken a few years for everybody to warm up to it. And I still don't love it on some of the other designs, but, uh, I, I think it really works with the proportions of this, um, and yeah, to the your point with the BMWs, I mean, every, like, look at the new 7 Series. I mean, that thing's giant. Um, and it's, oh, like, comically so. Uh, where Because it just looks like a bigger version of, like, the traditional, like, twin kidney grill. Where this is, uh, I mean, it doesn't look like any past Lexus except for something from the past, like, five years. Um, so yeah, I think you're right. I think they were probably, like, a little ahead of it. A uh, little ahead of the trends and it works. It works really, really well. I cannot wait to drive this thing. Yeah. I think some of what helps the spindle grill on this car in particular is that it's such a low nose and it has so much shape oh. to it because it kind of like bends around the top and then into the bottom. It kind of helps hide some of the size so it doesn't, it doesn't feel quite as opposing. Whereas like on the Lexus LX SUV, it's just this wall of grill and it's a little much. <laughs> I actually like that though. Like when you go like way back, cars used to have really big grills. So mm -hmm. I think I'm okay with this trend. I know we were kind of making fun of the X7 a while ago. I don't care. You know, it's, you got to do something to make cars stand out. And, uh, you know, I kind of like it. Uh, that's also the LC 500 is our tech of the year winner from 2018. I'd be remiss, remiss if I didn't mention that specifically it was for the hybrid system, but, uh, you know, we've driven this car a few times over the years, and yeah, man, 403, can't wait to drive it. And I think one of the other things that I really love about it is that it feels genuinely special. Like, it doesn't feel or look like anything else on the road. It, like well, That's a really good point. Like, it costs a lot of money. It's like $90,000, $100,000, but if I had that money, I would feel like it was a completely worth it. It's like, it sounds right, it looks right, and it feels more unique than most cars. $97,000. Yeah. And like one last like quick thing about it. Like if you were expecting a super sharp sports car, you're going to be disappointed. Um, there are sharper, like better handling, uh, more powerful sports cars out there for this money. Um, but if you want a really, really good GT, that's something that looks good. That sounds good. That's still really comfortable. Um, the LC is your like buy. Like if be honest about what your needs are and like, if you're looking for something, I, I think this is actually a really good buy at right around a hundred thousand. I agree. It's definitely worth the money. I think, um, in some ways it looks and feels, I think more special than some nine elevens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the M eight or the eight series we had in here, I would take this over the eight series all day. Yeah. Um, it does have a, you know, very, almost like an old school, like, like, like you said, special quality that makes this car feel like driving is an event and you, I mean, there's like almost nothing that looks like this on the road when you're going down the street. I mean, people, I mean, people were taking pictures of it in the parking lot the other day and it's just kind of like, it's a movie star car. 
Yeah, actually, I I got passed by a Bentley Continental GT the other day when I was driving. I was like, yeah, I would definitely take this over the Continental. <laughs> mm. Yeah, maybe. Maybe I, I maybe I'm pushing it that. a little bit there, but like I I was like, this I feel cooler in this than I do. <laughs> than Charger I in versus uh, M5, <laughs> uh, Continental versus Lexus. This is an interesting podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's for like half the price. What can you get? But how about we talk about the Defender? Yeah, let's talk Defender. It's coming back. Uh, we know this Frankfurt Motor Show in September. Uh, not sure if I'm going to get to that, or if any of us are going to get to that. You know, auto shows are declining a little bit. But man, Frankfurt in the fall is pretty awesome, actually, as I think about it. Anyways, there'll be a Land Rover Defender there. Uh, Land Rover themselves has put out some spy shots. Uh, we've actually got several stories on this topic recently. So um, basically, in the the, tease, the excuse me, the interior was also teased recently. Spy shots. So there's a lot going on. I mean, now that we know a lot about this, and I know Jewel, you wrote one of these pieces. I mean, what do we think? Is this going to like live up to the hype? Is it tracking how we want it to live up to the hype? Because for so long, the Defender was this thing that we couldn't get. And, um, you know, Land Rover, which is one of the original rough and tough SUV brands, was watching Jeep and now maybe Ford with the Bronco, you know, come in and just suck up all the oxygen. And now they're bringing back one of their, you know, original Halo products. So I, I'm curious you know, how are we feeling about this right now in late June of 2019? Have you, have either of you ever driven an original Defender? No. I have not, no. They're garbage. I mean, I they it. look <laughs> really cool um, and they've got like a ton of charm, but they are really bad to drive. I mean, they, like, it's just, it's a tractor. I mean, it is like totally utilitarian. They're slow, they're uncomfortable, the steering is bad. I mean, uh, you know me, I hated the old G-Class before it got redesigned so i'm sure that i would hate the i'm sure i would hate the old defender and it's it's much the same way so i'm expecting i mean i don't know if it's going to drive as well as the new g-class but expect that same level of like update where it's still got the styling but it drives like a modern vehicle because nobody like nobody's actually going to use this as a farm truck not like the original defender was intended or used as um this is going to be like a really nice uh comfortable suv with some really cool styling um so i think that's how it's gonna play out it's it's gonna drive how you wish the original one did um and um, it's it's gonna like be practical and like easy to uh see out of and like improve on like all the things you like yeah, it, it's going to be your dream Defender um, and not like the reality of the old Defender. That's a really good headline right there. Maybe at a column or something from maybe from Frankfurt, your yeah. dream Defender is here. Well, I'll say it'll probably be a dream Defender for people that will go and buy them and use them on the road on a regular basis. I'm sure they're going to sell a whole bunch of them. It will not be the dream Defender for the hardcore off-road set that love the old one because it's going to be independent suspension all the way around. It's unibody. Like the, those are two huge strikes against it already. Um, just, be, I mean, there's a reason the Wrangler is still basically a truck. It's body on frame. It's got solid axles front and rear. And don't get me wrong. I know that Land Rover can make something like this off road really well, but the guys that love off roading don't like that stuff. They like the old stuff. <laughs> um, I think this is going to be like the G wagon and nobody is actually going to care. I like nobody, even if they were doing an update, like I don't think anybody was actually going to ever take this off road. I mean, they're doing the independent suspension, um, the unibody platform. I, it doesn't matter one iota to the people that were actually going to shell out the money. Well, that's the thing. I am sure it's going to sell great. Um, I don't think Land Rover has anything to worry about. But there's but the hardcore group that like loves off roading and loves the old Defender, they're going to be upset about it. I don't they're think, not going to buy them. Probably they probably wouldn't have bought them even if they were what they were hoping for. But that's the thing. I don't think Jaguar actually like or sorry JLR uh, Jaguar Land Rover actually cares what the old people think because mm -hmm. they're mean, not going to buy new ones. They haven't sold a Defender here in roughly twenty years. So I mean, the people who are like that market are like literally not going to be like around to be this market if you will they've got their classic and that's it and they've probably moved on to other types of vehicles so i don't know i mean i'm a little torn on this one i'm looking at the pictures and it kind of just looks like 
a smaller, somewhat conventional Land Rover SUV. I know we've seen like, that's the camoed up vehicle though. There's some other shots that are a little more revealing. Like we saw this Lego thing that may or may not be close to the Defender. There's a, we had a shot of like a Defender in like an infotainment panel. I'm a little underwhelmed. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of thinking they didn't go retro enough here. But again, we haven't really seen it, so I'm going to somewhat reserve judgment. I think you guys are right on. It's going to drive like eh, kind of sketchy, if you will, for lack of a better way to put it. It'll be like better than the old one, but still probably, you know, much rougher than a lot of people will like. And the people who won't like it just won't buy it. Uh, I keep going back to like how much I like like the Wrangler and the Forerunner. Uh, fairly different vehicles, but same kind of ethos, if you will. And I mean, for the price, I mean, and we'll talk about this in a little bit more about the Gladiator uh, coming up in a bit, but the Wrangler is a pretty good deal when you see like what Mercedes charges for the G-Wagon and what Land Rover will undoubtedly charge for the new Defender. So I don't know. I mean, I'm kind of a Land Rover fan. I like the Discovery. I like the Velar. I like all the different Range Rovers. I mean, I really like what they're doing. I think you know, their infotainments kind of suck. Some of their interiors are uneven, but uh, driving them is fun. It's a little bit of a mini event. So, I mean, right now I'm kind of like, uh, wait and see. I wouldn't even say I'm in the cautiously optimistic camp. I'd say I'm more like, okay, let's hope they can pull this off. Whereas I sort of feel like Ford's going to get the Bronco right. Jeep, we thought would get the Gladiator right, and they did. With this, I'm more like somewhere in that gray area, 50-50. Like, will it be fine? Will it be good? Sure. But I'm not sure I'm going to love it. You know, it kind of seems like that's where you guys might be too. I don't oh, know. No, I'm sure I'm going to love this thing. You're going to love this thing? Okay. 100%. Like, I don't care, like, if it drives poorly. Of the, I'm stoked based on, like, the spy shots that we've seen so far. Um, You know, if they can get this thing in, like, under, like, 100,000... Uh, it's going to be like a cheap G-Wagon. I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's probably not going to have a V8, uh, but that's okay. I like. I just want something that looks really cool, and I think this thing's going to look really cool, and that's like 90% of it for me. I, and, I think I'm going to love it. And I'm sure that's what the buyers are looking for. It, it's just like the buyers of G-Wagons. I mean, they buy them because that's what they they like the way it looks, and they like that kind of feel of... Oh, I have this legendary off-roader and I take it to the mall every weekend. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, most like, people that own, own the older defenders, like buy it because it looks cool mm -hmm. and you can take the top off. Now I wish, I doubt they're going to do a topless version of this. It'd be cool, but I don't see it happening, but that'd be, that would be so cool. Yeah. And uh, if, if they did a truck version too, well, I but mean, <laughs> I'm not sure what the market would be for that. Probably not at all, but. And the I, thing is, like, if you're looking for something more hardcore off-roading, you can go buy a Wrangler or you can go buy a Bronco when it comes out. I will say this, as I look, will I probably end up liking this thing? Sure, probably I will. The wheel wells, as I look a little closer at some of these spy shots, yeah, this thing does look pretty cool. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I'd say on the scale of, you know, Joel to Reese, I'm somewhere, eh, I don't know. Not as excited <laughs> as Reese. Maybe a little more excited than Joel. Maybe we're right in that same area. I don't know. So uh, we mentioned the Bronco. Let's talk a little bit more about the Bronco. Uh, we hear it's going to use the Ranger inline four. Uh, rumor uh, going around just this week. That's the 2.3 liter uh, turbocharged four cylinder. Um, so that's, I, as I think about it, that makes entirely sense. I mean, why wouldn't they use that engine for this? Um, it's going to be based on the Ranger. So yeah, I mean, use the Ranger engine. <laughs> of course. So it's kind of like you put it all together. Like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, we've driven the, uh, the Ranger. What do we think? Is this going to be good for the Bronco? I, I like, this is totally expected and I think it's going to be fine. Um, it's, uh, in the Ranger, this engine's got like plenty of torque. It's got good fuel economy. Um, it's got like near or top of the class for payload and towing. I mean, it's going to have the capability. Um, it may not sound all that great. I don't love the sound of this engine, but I don't think Bronco owners are really going to care. Um, and who knows? Maybe they'll do a, a, like a Raptor version with the 2.7. That would be cool. That would be um, amazing. <laughs> but yeah, I've got no problem with this ha thing having a four-cylinder. I mean, it's going to have the like the performance numbers. So cool. It's going to get better fuel economy. 
And also on the sound side of things, nothing in this segment sounds good. The yeah. Wrangler doesn't sound good. The uh, Colorado doesn't sound good. None of them sound good. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't think, I don't think this is really going to hurt it at all. Um, you know, EcoBoost has been hugely successful for Ford. If owners were going to care, they would have cared six or seven years ago when they started phasing out the V8s as the top level engines and they've downsized pretty much across the board. I, I don't think this is going to hurt it one bit. I don't actually care so much that it's a four cylinder as opposed to say a V6 or something. I don't love this engine to be honest. So that's, I think what could be, um, could be an issue. I mean, in the Ranger that we had, you know, just a few weeks back, it was fine. It was okay. Got the job done. You know, it was okay. In, you know, in our midsize truck comparison, there were probably better powertrains like the Chrysler V6. The, the Chevy V6 was better. Um, I don't know. It's a toss up with the Tacoma. That thing's, in my opinion, was a little, little raggedy, but, um, I, will it be fine? A turbo four cylinder and a Bronco. I, I actually, I can kind of see that. It makes sense. All that low end torque. Uh, but I just wasn't totally in love with this engine. So to me, and I think Snyder would probably back me up here. That's our senior editor for all things green. It's like, okay, it's fine. It's sure it's to be expected, but I know he mentioned that he would like the Ranger more like if, and when they refresh it, maybe tried something else with the powertrain. And so for me, I'm kind of like, okay, that's what you're going to put in the Bronco right out of the box. Okay, sure. Fine. I mean, will it be fine? Yes, it will. But to me, this engine is just, it's okay. Fine. I'd like to drive a Ranger in like a year and see if they've gotten some of the refinement issues like sorted out. Um, The engine, I agree with you with the engine. Uh, I think the the 10 speed is a little like wonky too. Some uh, It does no favors. Let's put it that way. So I'm hoping they kind of like, after a model year, they like do some internal updates that kind of under the radar. Um, and by the time the Bronco comes out, can smooth this out. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It was not my favorite engine in the uh, truck test that we did, but uh, it was serviceable. And like, like I said, the performance numbers are there. It, like on paper, this thing gets really good fuel economy, good payload, good towing. Um, and I think it's got more torque than anything in the class. So, yeah. So something I wanted to ask you guys, Wrangler is obviously the competition for the Bronco. How do you feel about the like Ranger four-cylinder versus the Wrangler four-cylinder and the Wrangler V6? Uh, I didn't love the Turbo 4 and the Wrangler. I mean, it, like we had that um, uh, Rubicon two-door last week that you wrote the column on. And I think, Joel, you had it over the weekend. Mm-hmm. Uh, I prefer the V6. I just like the feel of the natural aspirated engine better. Um the fuel economy is obviously better in the two liter. And it wasn't bad. I just ideal my ideal Wrangler would have a V6 and a manual transmission, and you can't get the manual with the Turbo Four, um, and you probably won't be able to get a manual at all in the Bronco. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know I'll be a little bit of a prisoner of the moment. I think I like the uh, Turbo Four in the Wrangler better than the Turbo in the Ranger. I just to me it was oh, a little yeah I'm with you there better engine. Um, so yeah, I mean that's where I would land on those two head to head. Which one would I buy in the Wrangler? That's uh, tough. I mean I might go with the Turbo because it's I mean it's also new. It's a different feel. Uh, but the Pentastar V6 is pretty bulletproof. I mean especially off road. I would want that just straight, linear, predictable, you know, Pentastar V6. So, yeah, that's a good question. All right, speaking of off-roaders, how about the uh, the GMC Jimmy maybe coming back? I feel like every week we're like, what crazy off-roader from the 90s is coming back? Mm-hmm. Last week we were talking about the Hummer. This week the Jimmy may be coming back. This is a kind of a rumor mill post on our website. Um a lot of different theories about how this could work. It could be a Wrangler fighter, you know, would obviously fall into that Bronco range as well. Um, I think it makes a good deal of sense for GMC to do this. I think they are probably the right brand at General Motors to do it. Uh, the Blazer is now something else. So, you know, that name's taken. And I think it would make sense, you know, let GMC, which is a truck brand, at least it, you know, purports to be, um, Giving them an off-road sort of Wrangler fighter, let that be maybe a bit of a halo vehicle. I imagine it would look pretty cool because GMC has had some pretty good concepts. It's been a while, but 
you know, early mid two thousands, they were rolling out some of these things. Um, so I think this would be a good move. Uh, I think GM, this is a good move, move for GMC. They need something that helps, uh, differentiate themselves from Chevy because everything in their lineup is just a rebadged Chevy for better or worse. Um, I like the looks of some of their products better than the Chevy version, but there's nothing that like makes them different. Uh, I think it'd be cool. I mean, I like, I used to own a blazer. Um, I owned a blazer two door and a blazer four door. Um, so the new blazer is kind of a disappointment, but if they can make the Jimmy kind of that old school truck feel great, I'm like hundred percent on board for this. I think they could do it even fairly cheaply too. Cause the thing is, GM sells an SUV version of the Chevy Colorado and GMC Canyon in Australia. It's the Holden Trailblazer. And it literally looks like a Colorado where they shortened the back of it and made it an SUV. Like, if you could just restyle that, give it a nicer interior, give it the U.S. powertrains, call it a day, sell it for big markup and a Denali trim, <laughs> make a lot of money on it. And that's where you get into this, like the Denali business. I mean, I bet the take rate on Denali for a GMC Jimmy would be pretty high. Um, the take rate on Denali as GMC as a whole is like is over high. a third. Yeah. And people love Denali. Yeah. I mean, like I was, when we had the Blazer a while back, someone came out and was talking to me and I told them the price of it, which was quite high. And it was like, wow, that was more expensive than my Denali. He didn't say it was a GMC. He didn't say it right. was what model it was. He said it was a Denali. That's what mattered to him. <laughs> Denali is a very cool brand. Arguably, it's cooler than GMC. Yeah. The GMC and GM as a whole has done a really good job at marketing uh, Denali. I mean, we can make the argument all day long, like I just did, that their products are just rebadged Chevys. But it exists because it's a cash cow. I mean, they make so much money. I mean, you look at, look at uh, the uh, Sierra. Like a Denali is basically like a thirty-five thousand dollar truck with forty thousand dollars, like on top of it, with an interior that probably costs another ten grand. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the profit margins on these trucks are huge. Um, that's like a third of GM stock price yeah, right there. I mean, like, I mean, that's why we, like uh, so many people are like shocked by the uh, value of these trucks, and they're going to keep raising the prices and adding more and more trims on the top end as long as they can sell them. I mean, they, they, uh, when I drove the Sierra last year in Canada, um, on the first drive, like they said, like, I think like 35% of Sierra sales are Denali. And like, if they come out with a Jimmy that they're going to have a base one, or maybe an AT4, that would be awesome, but they're going to sell a ton of really luxury ones. Um, and on the topic of AT4, that would be another advantage of if they build it off of like the Colorado trailblazer platform you've got all that great ZR2 stuff that you could then stick under it. The Multimatic spool valve shocks and the big tires. And I mean, yeah, all, all the bits are there. They just have to put them together. <laughs> if this was like a GMC badge ZR2 SUV, I mean, that's what a lot of hardcore people would want. That's mm -hmm. what I would want. Um, and cool. Maybe stick the diesel engine in there. Cause that would give it something yeah. a little different. Um, yeah, I think this is a cool thing. I uh, don't know if it'll actually happen, but I'd love to see some, an alternative to like the Wrangler or the Forerunner. What I and think Bronco. is, it, yeah, and <laughs> yeah. Bronco. What I think is interesting too is that last week uh, we reported this and then talked about it on the podcast that Hummer might be coming back. So what I mean, these are all like pretty like rumor, rumory rumors. Let's put it that way. Yes, I it. When I think about it, I think it's more likely that both of these events would happen versus one. Now you might say, well, that's aggressive. How, how, what scenario would that play out in where they have all this money? But I sort of feel like if a car company like say GM were to identify that they really need to win in this rough and tough SUV area, there might even be some sort of shared learnings. It would all be in support of like a broader strategy to win in this area. And to me to do that, you you go ahead and win. You don't just do one thing. You do like three things. You know, you get the GMC Jimmy. Maybe you had one or two Hummer models, which would probably be sold in probably Buick GMC showrooms. I don't know. Um, so I don't know. To me, I just sort of feel like there's a lot of rumblings now. And I think where there's smoke, there's fire. I think we're going to see, I, if I were going to say which is more likely, I'd say the Jimmy, but, um, you know, maybe both. And that'd be cool. So I think 
Jimmy makes a lot of sense in my mind. I think Hummer as an idea is kind of cool and it makes, and like, they definitely have, would have the style to like fight Wrangler, but I think it would actually be a bad idea for GM because even as all electric, which is kind of how they're allegedly doing it. I mean, maybe, but the thing is, is it's expensive and it's hard to launch a brand. Even, even if you've launched it before, I mean, it, it's still like building up your dealer network, building up brand awareness, not just for a new model, but for an entire new brand and also a brand that has some baggage. Cause yeah, that was going to be my point is like, we all think back to the Jimmy and the Blazer and the Bronco. They're like, oh, yeah, these are cool. Hummer didn't leave with, like, the best reputation. No. Like, no. Uh, like, it died, and, like, it was the symbol for, like, everything that was wrong with the economy and American car shoppers. And, like, if they came back with an EV, I think it'd be interesting. But, yeah, to, I agree with Joel. Like, this is this is going to be a hard sell. And I think it would be better to go ahead and, like, start implementing those EVs in your existing brands yeah. and kind of like improve those brands images also, as opposed to trying to kickstart something completely new. I mean, yeah. I'd love a vehicle that kind of is in the old theme of Hummer, but I, I don't, I don't know if Hummer's actually going to turn around. Jimmy, I could totally see this. Um, Jimmy doesn't have much baggage, yeah. if any baggage. I think that's an easier play. Um, and I, and to be clear, I would not advocate relaunching the Hummer <laughs> brand. I think that's kind of insane. I said last week I was a little more positive on the podcast, but just to be clear, I would suggest or could see a scenario where like having perhaps like, you know, one Hummer model that has a very niche purpose, I could see that, but relaunching like five or six of these things like oh no that's just that's not the right move as i kind of reflect on it so but i think the reason they're looking at this is because things like oh i don't know the gladiator <laughs> are charging like twenty thousand dollar markups uh, another interesting story uh, we had this on the site this week um man i mean we're not surprised i mean we knew these things were going to be expensive and they are i mean FCA is usually pretty good about shooting down markups with its dealers, but um, I mean, they need to get better, I guess. $20,000 markups on some of, some of these things is, is pretty pretty fierce. They are selling every single one they can build. Anybody that's saying this thing's too expensive, like if it's, if it's selling, I don't think it's too <laughs> expensive. And it's, you know, you could talk about a sixty seventy thousand dollars $70,000 like Gladiator all day long. People are going to buy it. Um, if you really want one, wait a year when like uh, things kind of settle down, as you probably should anyway. Um, maybe you get a lease on a Wrangler right now and fl like trade that in for a Gladiator in another year and a half or two. Um, Even this just, doesn't surprise me at all. I yeah. mean, the big market, like they could probably charge thirty thousand, and there is going to be somebody out there that's going to buy it. I mean, this. I don't know if I've driven anything this year that's as cool as the Gladiator. I mean, it it is. Awesome. And we talked about that on the truck tests. Um, go back and listen to the podcast, like watch the video. Like we all love the gladiator. We talked about it. it it's pricey, but it's cool. And then like for a lot of people, that's all that matters. It's you like, might, you might even say we are entertained. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's, I'm sorry. I, indeed. I, I mean, that's fair though. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I'd like, it's might be a little shocking to some people, but it's not surprising. to me. More power to them. Yeah. I mean, if you could get that much, I mean, okay. I mean, it's, I mean, clearly there was demand for this truck. People are super fired up about it. And it also, you know, I mean, we tested it. It almost won. I mean, it like it lost by a hair. I mean, yeah. 1.9 points. So I mean, we been, clearly liked the vehicle. Yeah. If it, 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 it's, it came down to like a margin. Um, and yeah, this thing's so cool. I, uh, they I, delivered on what they said they would do, I, which I think doesn't they, always happen. I think they over-delivered. I think this thing's better than it need to be. Um, like the last, like the JK Wrangler, like especially towards the end of its life, was really dated, and they were selling a ton of them. And all the updates for the JL um, were really good, and those all carried over to the Gladiator. I mean, this thing could have been worse than it actually is, and it would still be selling as well as it does. Um, and I think that's like the probably like my favorite bit about it is that it's like not miserable like old jeeps were kind of like bad to drive i mean 
you bought them because they were charming and they were capable um, and they looked awesome. And now they've got a really good interior and a really good infotainment system and they're reasonably quiet. Like uh, this thing drives better than like, it drives as good as probably a full size truck from 15 years ago, um, which is better than it needs to. I like the gladiator is so, so cool. They are definitely in a good place. You know, we still are kind of, we're excited about the Bronco. We're curious about the Defender. We're wondering about the GMC Jimmy, but Jeep, the Gladiator is out there and they delivered with it. So, I mean, that's a good place for them to be. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's talk real quick here. Wrap up news with the Ford Puma, uh, a kitten sized crossover. What a great headline by, uh, <laughs> Antti Kautinen, one of our freelance writers. Uh, it's kind of an echo sport. Uh, it's pretty good looking, uh, I, I wish car. it was an Echo Sport. <laughs> you so yeah. I, Joel's take on the Echo Sport is it's awful. <laughs> yeah. So break this down, Joel. What do you think? You like this thing? I mean, I, I have think... a pair of Puma shoes. That's my only <laughs> thing. So I guess the first thing to like knock out is the fact that it's using a name that was previously used in Europe on this really nifty little sport coupe that looked really cool. It was very athletic and um. I wish that we'd gotten it here, but we didn't. Um, and now it's on a crossover because everything old is now a crossover. <laughs> I mean, we've got an Eclipse Cross in the basement right now. Uh, but I think it actually looks kind of cool. It looks very happy. <laughs> it's got big, big headlight eyes. Um, and I would love to see it here as the new Echo Sport because I hate the current Echo Sport. Like, I don't hate the current Echo Sport, <laughs> but this does appearances look better than the echo sport mm -hmm. i mean it looks like this was actually like well i mean it's going to be sold in europe it's been designed for like first world markets the echo sport was designed to be like extra cheap kind of rugged transportation in like developing markets it's an interesting take what do you think reese is the puma your style so i had to actually google what the old puma was everybody was like up in arms on twitter and i'm you know we're automotive journalists. Like we pretty m know cars pretty well, and even stuff that they don't sell in the U.S. I had no clue what the Puma was. Um, this thing looks cool. It's kind of cutesy, but so is everything else in this class. Um, looks like a Ford Focus that's lifted a little with some big eyes. Um, yeah, I am kind of in line with Joel on the Echo Sport. It's not very good um, in a class that's like not very good. It's not very mm -hmm. good. Uh, this thing looks cool. I mean, like, I, this class of cars is all about style. I mean, you look at, like, the Hyundai Kona, you look at the Toyota CHR, uh, and, like, everything here is all about style, and this, and some of it's a little much for me. Like, I don't care for the looks of the Kona, and I don't care for the looks of the CHR. I would drive this. I, I think it looks really cool. Um, and if Ford is doing what they're doing with everything else, a Puma ST would be pretty rad. That sounds yeah, good. I would rock that. Like, I like that. Yeah. Well, like, I don't know if I'd rock it, but I, I would be I would be fine with one. <laughs> think of this with like, you know, the turbo one point six out of the Fiesta, like mm -hmm. maybe two hundred horsepower. Yeah. Or even like the new the three cylinder that's in the European market Fiesta. Right. Yeah. It's I think this I really like the looks of it. Um as cute as it is. Um I'm sure it's probably gonna be pretty good to drive because most of the current crop of Fords are pretty good to drive. Um yeah, I'm actually kind of excited about this thing. I really do hope that they bring it over. I mean, there's no plans right now, but, you know. They've got to replace all these sedans with some crossovers, and exactly. this is nominally a crossover, so it makes sense to me. Uh, yeah, man, swap out the Echo Sport for the Puma. Uh, and I think like, that'd be cool. Even though the Echo Sport hasn't been on the U.S. market for that long, it's it's an old vehicle because it was it is. on sale in other markets for longer. And so, I mean, and... I don't think there'd be much love loss if they went ahead and replaced it. <laughs> no, I mean, I literally get a Super Bowl commercial with a Puma. People would forget the Echo Sport was ever a thing. It's already confusing because they have EcoBoost, mm -hmm. uh, which some people call Echo Boost. Like, just, you know, literally punt on the Echo Sport, bring in the Puma. So if they brought the Puma here, they probably wouldn't call it a Puma because that doesn't fit the Ford crossover suv naming that's scheme. unfortunate because it works yeah it works so well um and i mean i would be fine if they just slapped echo sport badges on it and called it a day uh i'd say call it a puma i really would yeah. echo sport well, i don't think is a good name i was wondering like 
could we like brainstorm an idea for an e name that they could use? Expedition. Well, just that's... like go like double down <laughs> and call what was used used to be the biggest SUV on the market. The Expedition this... L for little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, S for like small sporty. No, no, excursion is what you mean, <laughs> yeah. right? There oh, we go. I do mean well, excursion. Yeah, and I was thinking uh, about that. That would be like the greatest <laughs> April Fool's Day joke ever. Is like the four excursions back. It's here to fight four or fight uh, Hummer, and then boom, <laughs> it's uh, this little Puma thing. But you know what would be funny about that is the fact that like excursion makes more sense as a name for a small vehicle because like an excursion, yeah, it's just like I'm taking an excursion down to the park and just kind of. Just a little outing as, and like expedition makes sense for a big one. So it was weird that like excursion was the super size SUV when it came out. So side note, I think they should bring back the excursion. I mean, now's the time to do it. <laughs> super duty. They SUV need more again. SUVs. Why not? They, they could do it. They've already got the expedition max. Is it that they call is it, it really called the expedition max? I, You're yeah, not the long yeah. wheelbase one is that. Oh I mean, that thing is as big as an, as an excursion. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Just box in the super duty and call it a, I call it the excursion. <laughs> Ford Fairlane. Or even Expedition Super Falcon, Duty. Falcon would work. I know it's got to start with an E, but whatever. Econoline? No. <laughs> no, no. The, Ford, right. the Escapade? The Escapade? The Escape That's and the bad. Escapade? <laughs> okay. All right. Mark it now. June 26th. <laughs> yeah. I called Ford Escapade. There you go. Um, I'm still going to go with uh, Excursion. Anyways, let's spend some money uh, on that note. So, this week's uh, Spend My Money comes to us from Twitter user Devin, who uh, basically is reaching out and wants to know what the best electric vehicles are that aren't priced like the Tesla. So looking for something a little more, uh, you know, cheaper, basically. Uh, his lease is up soon and wants a full EV, not a hybrid. Would love a Tesla, but it costs too much. What are the moderately priced EVs? Hey, man, thanks for writing, uh, reaching out on Twitter. Uh, let's answer the question. So my two favorites right now, straight up, Chevy Bolt EV and the Hyundai Kona EV. Um, Similar-ish range. The Bolt is a little bit lower at like 238 miles. The Kona is a little higher at 258 miles. Um, and I like my main differentiator there is that if you need the space, buy the Bolt because it's super crazy practical. It's super roomy, loads of headroom, like really comfortable, really practical. Um, if you want something that's a little bit sportier, more fun to drive, a little funkier, get the Kona because it, it's smaller, but I think it handles better. Uh, it's little, it, it just, it feels a lot sportier. Um, yeah, I, I love both of them though. I mean, I'd happily drive either of them. Breeze. Yeah. I'm kind of withdrawing this one. The bolt I've auto crossed the bolt and it's a lot of fun and around auto cross course. It's about as quick as a GTI. Um, and you know, you're not like burning hydrocarbons so that's cool um yeah i've not spent any, as much time in suvs or um, evs as some of the other guys on staff but uh yeah the bolt's cool i mean kirstein alex kirstein our senior editor owns a leaf so um that's a good choice obviously it's a editor's pick if we one of us owns it but it's an an a editor's pick yeah, i don't know if it's the staff editor's pick, editors. but it could yeah an editor's pick yeah i can um, talk it's been a long podcast <laughs> it's a long day. Um, in a yeah. hot room. <laughs> I like the Bolt. I mean, it, the Bolt's a lot of fun. Um, you know, try them all. Uh, I I wish I'd spend some more time in EVs, but uh, uh, Joel and John seem to think the Kona and the Nero are pretty good to mm -hmm. drive as well as, like, being efficient. Um, so, yeah. yeah. And the Nero drives very much like the Kona. What I don't like as much about it is the, I don't like the driving position and seats as much. Like you sit really high up in it. Like you can tell that there's been some uh, finagling under the chassis to get the batteries in. Um, I think the Bolt has the best packaging. And I think a lot of that is because it was designed to be an EV from the start, whereas the Kona and the Nero both started as gas cars. Um, but yeah, they're great. The Nissan Leaf is good too. And I think it's actually more refined uh, from a driving standpoint than the Chevy and the Hyundai. Uh, but it doesn't handle as well. Uh, it's not, it doesn't feel as powerful. It's got shorter range too. The long range one is like 220 miles. Um, and then like the short range one is 150 miles. The trade off there of course is that the 150 mile one is a lot cheaper. 
the leaf is interesting to me. I think you get some of that almost, um, you get some of that real EV cred with that. Cause I think people know what the Nissan leaf is. Whereas the Nero and the Kona people are still figuring out exactly what those mean. Uh, metrically they, they might be better than the leaf. So, uh, really good options. But if I were going to pick one, uh, I would just say pretty simply lightning strikes three times. I'd go with the bolt too. Uh, and that's all the time we have this week. Thanks for listening. Guys, this is a lot of fun. We covered a lot of topics. By my count, five news items and four cars. Plus, we spent some money. It's really hot. Be safe out there, guys. Thanks for listening. Uh, have a safe, uh, safe weekend. We'll see you next week.